Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Inspiring you to bring God back into the conversation of the day. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles. Arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise. By your power, we will go. By your spirit, we are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Good morning. It's Hour two of Mornings with Carmen here on the Faith Radio Network. Um, I hope you, I hope you've already been in the Word of God today. I hope the Word of God is making its way into you before you get out there into the world that God so loves. That's the only way that you and I are going to be able to um, manage this day and do so in ways uh, that honor Jesus. So, thank you so much for your partnership of the Gospel. Thank you for being here today. Uh, It is the 11th of January, and so I am in Psalm 11. Where in the word are you today? I am in Psalm 11. And I thought today um, we would do something a little bit different. I like to read from a number of translations, and this isn't, um, I'm going to use the word translation here really broadly because this is um, technically not a translation. Um, This is a person's interpretation. And so, You've probably heard me uh, in the past advocate that, uh, you know, you and I ought to be making the Word of God our own, um, not suggesting that we are rewriting the words of God, but there ought to be a version of the Bible that, like, makes sense to you. And so I've jokingly referred to um, the, the CL V, which is the Carmen LeBurge version, which just means that um, I like to engage in the practice, particularly when it comes to the Psalms, but other passages of Scripture as well. Um, I like to engage in the practice of like putting it in words that I understand, putting it in in phrasing and pacing that makes sense to me, like rewriting it in a way that makes sense to me. And so um, the message is really the Eugene Peterson version of the Bible. We could call it the EPV, but it's not called the EPV, it's called the message. And if you've ever, um, or if you've never read a passage from the message, then let me encourage you um, to to do that. In addition to whatever version of the Bible you're reading from, um, add reading it in the message as a way of amplifying it. And so here we go, Psalm 11 from the message. I've already run for dear life straight to the arms of God. So why would I run away now when you say, run to the mountains, the evil bows are bent, the wicked arrows aim to shoot under cover of darkness at every heart open to God. The bottoms dropped out of the country. Good people don't have a chance. But God hasn't moved to the mountains. His holy address has not changed. He's in charge as always his eyes taking everything in, his eyelids unblinking, examining Adam's flesh and blood inside and out, not missing a thing. He tests the good and the bad alike. If anyone cheats, God is outraged. Fail the test and you're out, out in a hail of firestones, drinking from a canteen filled with hot desert wind. God's business is putting things right. He loves getting the lines straight, setting us straight. Once we are standing tall, we can look him straight in the eye. So that is Psalm 11 from the message. Psalm 11 opens with this hypothetical question. Um, so in, in every other version of the Bible, you're going you're gonna to not have what Eugene Peterson does, which is establish where he is. So Eugene Peterson is establishing, look, I've already run for dear life straight to the arms of God. Why would I run away now and entertain this hypothetical question that you're posing? But the hypothetical question is what comes in verse 1 of Psalm 11 in most translations of the Bible. In the Lord, take refuge. Oh, in the Lord, I take refuge. How could you say to my soul, flee like a bird to the mountain? 
So the question is meant to show that the threat of ruin is coming. And what David says is in Psalm 11, the, yes, there's always a threat of ruin coming, but I have already run to the safe place. I am already sheltered under the wings of the Lord. I have already taken my refuge in God. And the rest of the psalm is a description of why David trusts God. David trusts God because of who God is and what God has done and what God will do. He's articulating that, you know, I I don't need to fear the wicked. Um, I don't need to um, run somewhere else for cover. God is good and he opposes evil and I'm with God. I'm already with God. I've already run to him for my shelter. So where is, um, where is the gospel in all of this? That's always a helpful question for us to ask uh, because the gospel is, is revealed throughout the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. It's not as if we only get the gospel in, um, in the New Testament after the appearance of Jesus. So if we know that God is with us, incarnate in the person of Jesus, and now present everywhere and always by the power of his Holy Spirit, operating in, through, and among those who believe in Christ, then this is an interesting psalm for us to consider, even as things in the world are going very badly in some places. (laughs) Who is God? That is ultimately the question. And where is God? And what is God up to? What is his character? And can we still count on God to be God? And the answer to all of that is yes. You can still take refuge in Jesus, and you can still see God's face. You can experience the satisfying intimacy of of being face-to-face with God by being face-to-face with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4.6 is a wonderful, um, wonderful verse to amplify Psalm 11. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory he has displayed in the face of Christ. God has already um, come face to face with everything that you and I are going to encounter. And you and I come face to face with God in the person of Jesus. So I'll ask you um, maybe the question that is asked here. I mean, don't you want to run to the mountains? I mean, you know, the evil bows are bent. The wicked arrows are aimed and they're shooting under cover of darkness at every person whose heart is open to God. So, you know, the, the bottom's dropped out of the country. Good people don't have a chance. Shouldn't you turn tail and run? And you and I say, as people of faith, <laughs> I have already run for dear life straight to the arms of God, and I already see him face to face in the person of Jesus. Whom shall I fear? There are brothers and sisters in Christ right now living in real fear and genuine desperation around the world. Um, We want to bring them into view this morning. Hannah Massad is the former pastor of the Gaza Baptist Church. He heads up the Christian mission to Gaza. And we're going to check in with him, a little status update on um, things in Gaza, our brothers and sisters in Christ there, and how you and I can be praying and engaging. That's up next here on Mornings with Carp. Joining us now, Pastor Hannah Massad. He um, has formerly served as the pastor of the Gaza Baptist Church. Um, he now heads up the Christian Mission to Gaza. His um, his book is uh, now widely available, Pastor for Gaza. It is uh, Hannah's story. Hannah, welcome back to Mornings with Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. It's great to be with you. Um, these are um, incredibly difficult days for brothers and sisters in Christ in Gaza. Um, I'm wondering if you could give us a status report, both on you know, individuals and families, and on the status of churches there. Um, Yeah, I'm very grateful, really, as brothers and sisters. First, we belong um, to one body, the body of Christ, and grateful for your prayers, your encouragement, because it's really a very difficult time. 
um, for our brothers and sisters in Gaza. As you know, there is about a thousand Christians in Gaza out of 2.2 million Muslims. And in the last um, uh, few weeks, um, um, people who evacuated in the churches in Gaza really be going through very uh, difficult times. Um, two ladies, um, for example, in the Latin church in Gaza been killed by sniper, Jewish sniper, and that was really very difficult. And five uh, also been injured, um, uh, people who's in the churches. And um, also the Gaza Baptist Church, which I had the privilege to pastor for 12 years. Um, there's a lot of damage in the church building uh, in Gaza. And uh, it's been tough uh, for the people, really very exhausted, very tired. Um, they want to leave, but they're not able to leave. They're stuck. Uh, so we really need to continue um, to pray for them. Um, I'm sorry sharing, you know, a difficult news, but also my um, our own home, my parents' home in Gaza, completely demolished. And this is, you know, where I grew up. Uh, took my father uh, almost 10 years to build that uh, home. So many Christians, um, after the war is over, they didn't really have a place to go to. So it's very challenging time, but, you know, our trust on the Lord, our faith in the Lord, and continue to pray, um, you know, for this difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate um, your prayers, all brothers and sisters. Again, um, we as followers of Christ, uh, our love uh, for all, our love for Israel, our love also for our brothers and sisters in Gaza, and also for the wider community, because all of us are created in the image of God, and every one of us very precious in the eyes of God, and uh, really the desire of God for all of us Amen. to come to know Him, and we know there is no real peace without the Prince of Peace. Amen. Um, for those of you listening right now, I just want you to just consider for a moment, um, you know, that you, like everybody else, are you know, scrolling through social media, particularly in a day and time when your particular community um, is highlighted. So I'm thinking here about the ways in which um, people would uh, would log on to social media sites trying to see what was happening on their street as the fires were raging in Northern California, or they would log on to social media to see if they could see what was happening to um, to their home, to their property uh, as, as a hurricane tore through um, the southern part of Florida or the Panhandle more recently. So like everyone, um, Pastor Hannah Massad has been scrolling social media. And before Christmas, he stumbled upon a video that showed um, his childhood home, or at least where it had formerly stood. And um, in accompanying um, that, he posted this. My daughter warmly reminisces about the mango trees that once adorned our surroundings, and the summer when a cat had a litter of kittens when we went back for a visit. My parents' home, a labor of love built by my father, accommodated our family of six siblings and our parents. And after Suhad and I were married, we added a second floor where we lived together for seven years, raising our two daughters until we evacuated in 2007. During my visits to Gaza for ministry work, I often returned to the comfort of our family home. So this, um, this conversation that we're having about what's happening in Gaza and what's happening to people in Gaza and what's happening to churches and Christians and people's homes um, is real. This is real for um, for Pastor Hannah Massad, with whom we're having a conversation today. And so as we continue this conversation in just a moment, um, and we talk a little bit about what growing up in Gaza was like and what it's like to be a Christian there, and he tells us more of his story, I just want you to be praying ardently. Um, not only for him and for his family and for the people he knows in Gaza, but for every person there whose family home um, has been destroyed. War is hell, and a lot of people are trying to live in the midst of it right now. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Jesus loves the little children. You guys know that. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. And right now, there are little children in the world who need Jesus. 
They also need things like basic food and medical care. Jesus tells us that what we do for the least of these, the little ones, we do for him. So this is your time to become the champion of one child, to change their life. When you sponsor just one child, you plant seeds of hope, and you work together with people who are on the ground to change the families, the communities, the future. You might not feel like you could change the world, but you can for one child. Meet the kids and find your child at MyFaithRadio.com. Continuing our conversation with Pastor Hannah Massad, he formerly served as the pastor of the Gaza Baptist Church. You can actually connect with the Gaza Baptist Church on Facebook, Gaza, G-A-Z-A, Baptist Church. You can connect with Pastor Hannah Massad on Facebook as well. Um, and I would commend to you the Christian Mission to Gaza, CM2G. So Christian Mission 2, that's a number, Gaza, cm2g.org, where you can um, see what Pastor Hannah is doing and how you might engage with him um, in bringing relief to Christians in Gaza today and extend the ministry in that particular location. I hope it was okay, um, Hannah, that I read part of your social media post um, about your family home. Um, When you talk about a mango tree and when you talk about a litter of kittens and when you talk about um, the first seven years of your own marriage and where you raised your two little girls um, and the family home to which you return, um, you know, have returned over time. That makes it real for each and every one of us, because for every single person, you know, that place exists. There is the place where we grew up. And um, in some cases, it doesn't exist anymore. And for you, you, um, the entire neighborhood is gone. There's nothing. There's the pictures. There's nothing there. So can you talk a little bit about when when we arrive at the time and the place when regular people in Gaza are allowed to return to their homes? Mm-hmm. What what's there? Like what how does that even make how does that even make sense? And how do we help make sense of that? Yeah, it's very, really, very emotional because uh, it's not just the building, it's not just walls and stones. You have a lot of memories, you have a lot of emotions. This is where you spend, you know, um, almost all all your life there. So, it's it's very uh, it's a very difficult time, and many people, uh, when the war is over, there is no place for them to go. And this is what one of the things we want to do as a Christian mission to Gaza, not only to help with food relief and medicine relief, but also to help people who didn't have a place to go to, um, to help them, um, you know, rebuild. And this is uh, what Christian mission to Gaza, you know, continue to do. Like we helping, uh, we help with uh, winter clothes at this difficult cold uh, time. And also the Lord helped us to help also the people in the churches with uh, groceries and also gas tanks and uh, some wheelchairs to the wider com- community and also uh, helping um more than 100 families in the Christian community, um, also with, you know, some um, cash money uh, to help them at this difficult time. And also God helped us uh, just uh, two days ago to provide 870 meals uh, for the people in the churches. And we're really grateful uh, how the Lord helped us to do that, even in um, in the midst of this uh, horrible, uh, difficult uh, war, uh, war, and also uh, with our partners, uh, we're able to uh, make some bread, um, and then uh, brothers able to take this bread to help people in the wider community who is really in desperate need, even for bread. So, and also things for children like milk, and uh, just very grateful how the Lord opened doors because in the beginning. Uh, we didn't know really how we could help, but we're very grateful how the Lord opened doors, even through a third, uh, you know, partner or third party uh, to reach out with his love um, in this uh, horrible time. Um, Pastor Hannah, I'm wondering if um, there are particular ways that we can be um, praying with you and for you um, today. 
Yeah, and yes, thank you, Carmen. And really, this is what uh, helped us to continue to move forward and continue to inspire uh, by the word of God and the Lord promises in this difficult time that he promises, uh, you know, continue to be with us. So I really appreciate uh, your prayers. Um, may the Lord uh, raise peacemakers at this difficult time in both sides mm. and in the international community so they will put the limit for this uh, difficult world because really uh, everybody's losing. But another thing on a personal level for the Christian community and for our um, brothers and sisters who are disciples um, of Christ, because it's very easy if we're not careful, uh, unforgiveness and bitterness will come and start to rule in our life. And I just want to say it's not worth it and because we really want his love and his forgiveness to rule uh, so please pray for that um, because uh, he is the most important thing um, for us and we want to keep our priorities right um, our faith uh, in the Lord and also the ministry he trusted in us we want to do it in a way pleasing to him and to bring a glory to his name expand his kingdom and may God even at this difficult time help us all to continue and especially um, brothers and sisters in Gaza continue to carry the presence of the Lord and also to reflect his love uh, these uh, difficult days. Let's pray. Father, we Amen. come before you as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, we, right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, um, are one in unity of spirit and bond of peace with brothers yes. and sisters in Gaza whose names we mm. don't know, but who you know so intimately. You know yes. right now um, how hungry they are. You know how thirsty they are. You know mm -hmm. how cold they are. You know Goodness. how um, bereft they feel. Mm -hmm. You know the prayers they're praying. And so, Father, we just want to join them. We want to join them in yes. whatever it is that they are crying out to you in this moment. Yes. That is, it is a it is a miracle of grace that we can mm. pray right now with them, and so yes. we want to do that. Mm. We pray alongside our brother um, for Christ. for these brothers and sisters in Christ that mm. unforgiveness and bitterness would not take root. Yes, Father, yeah. that that they would be so filled with um, your animating love that they would be so confident of your mm. presence and power that that mm. they there would be no room there would be no room for unforgiveness mm. or bitterness to find a place to take root yes lord father we ask that you would enable them to see jesus yeah. and that through their witness through their testimony mm. through the way that you shine in them by the power of your holy spirit that you would get your glory Yes. And that that would be the priority for each and all of us. Mm. Father, we do ask that the Christian mission for uh, Christian mission to Gaza would be fully equipped for every good work that you have prepared in advance for them to do, that they would have the necessary resources to do each good thing that you have um, planned for this day and the days to come. Yes, Lord. And that they would um, continue to do ministry that's pleasing to you. And Father, raise mm. up peacemakers. Raise up peacemakers on all sides, in, in around the world, in every community, um, yes, yes. and that and and that Christians would be the people who demonstrate what it means to sow peace, and to mm. and to live in peace, and to promote peace. Mm. And yes, Father, Lord. we recognize that Jesus is the dividing line in all of that. And so again, yes. we um, we set all of this before you in His precious and powerful, mm. redeeming name. Mm. In Jesus' yes. name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Bless you. Bless you, brother. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah. Please let us uh let us hear from you, okay? Stay in touch. Sure. Yeah. Amen. Good. Yes. Good. Amen. 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 That is Pastor Hannah Massad. He's a former pastor of the Gaza Baptist Church. He heads up the Christian mission to Gaza, CM2G. Dot org Christian Mission to Gaza. 
Um, you are listening to Mornings with Carmen. And next up, we're going to have a conversation about recovery. <laughs> you and I um, and everyone else, we're all recovering from something, are we not? Um, Jesus is the one who recovers us. I don't know if you recall the conversation that, um, that we had in the past with George Wood, but he talked with us about this approach to recovery um, that is acknowledging that actually we are recovered, that that is what Christ does. He recovers us. And so what does it look like? What does it mean not to focus on the thing from which we are in our own minds recovering, but to live as people who are recovered? George is going to join us again along with his co-author, Britt Eaton. Um, They are offering up the Uncovery Devotional. Rethinking recovery one day at a time. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. All right, buckle up, because this is going to be a um, a fast and energizing conversation. George Wood has been with us before. He is an ordained minister and a pastoral care counselor. Uh, he is the um, the the founder and the recovery activist behind the Uncovery, um, and today joins us with his co-author Britt Eaton, who is a writer and teacher and spiritual director. And together, they are bringing us the Uncovery Devotional: Rethinking Recovery One Day at a Time. George and Britt, welcome to Mornings with Carmen. Hey, Carmen, it's great to be back. I know. I'm just going to let I you talk it. over each other, and we're just going to all talk at the same time. It's going to be great. I love it's gonna it. It's going to be great. I love yeah. it. <laughs> so fun. Um, I have I have a lot of questions um, about um, about Britt's um, Brit's life and uh, in in a log cabin in Mount Vernon, Ohio. But I will save those for another time. Um, George, okay. How are how are things in inner city Tampa? Oh man, things are you know inner city. <laughs> it's it's always exciting every day. It, you know, things are going really well, though. Thank you for asking. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to start with you, George. Um, it's it's a new year. A lot of folks thinking about maybe recommitting themselves um, to to recovery, um, rethinking it. Um, so offer up for us, you know, how like right now is the perfect time. Right now is the perfect time to break the recovery mold and move into unrecovery or uncovery. Yeah. I keep putting sure. re in there, uncovery. Yeah, it's okay because the words are interchangeable. Um, you know, at the heart of them both, it's it's you know we're trying to do something that brings life to a person that is is really struggling. So it's okay to use them both ways. I think it's you know right now with the start of the year, for whatever reason, psychologically we tend to um, do better with starting something new, flushing everything you know in the past behind us. And what a better way to do it than taking a look at who God created you to be before the foundations of the world. That is the heart of the uncovery, where recovery for so long, especially people that have tried with addiction and things with, you know, severe mental health issues, um, they've often failed and feel like they can't get it right. And the truth is, God got it right for us 2,000 years ago. And so when we dig into that truth, into that reality, there's no better time to start than right now. I'm I'm so glad that you you pointed to some of those like multiple things that we're dealing with when we're talking specifically about a desire to move away from one thing. Um, there is a constellation of concerns here. You you know trauma, mental health, past experiences, um, maybe physical realities uh, of a mm-hmm. uh, physical addiction, like on and on and on. Britt, um, talk with us a little bit about the difference between maybe traditional, even Christ-centered, but traditional recovery approaches and what you guys are talking about and advocating in um, in the Uncovery devotional. 
Absolutely. So we've been doing recovery as the church in a formal way for a little over a hundred years. It kind of started with Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of very brave men got together and created a safe space for people to begin to explore what it would look like to let go of things like alcohol. We have, in fairness, come a long way in the church, but uh, as as we found with the COVID-19 pandemic and the unbelievable amount of mental health struggles that we saw come out of that and the addiction struggles we saw come out of that, we realized that even though the church has been somewhat open to helping, quote unquote, those people, we very much need to embrace the idea that recovery is really for everyone. So very different from traditional programming within our churches or even within our communities that would sort of t- reach out to the people on the outskirts of society, those on the margins. The uncovery movement is really geared toward anyone who is struggling in life. We are all carrying some types of trauma from our past. We are all struggling with something. So this takes the idea of recovery, normalizes it in the church and in our communities, and it allows people to love and lead people back better without judgment and it allows those who are struggling to come for support and help without shame. This is a big deal. So with the original book we wrote, um, the whole point of it was about the power of community in order to heal trauma. We didn't say to heal your alcoholism or to heal your mental health struggles specifically. We're talking about healing the deep-seated trauma that causes us to struggle in the first place. Even the best recovery programming out there, and there are some wonderful programs that I have been a part of and been in leadership within. These programs, they tout an 80% failure rate. That means within the first year of someone working uh, toward healing from their struggles, uh, 80% of them will fail within the first year. Now, take the uncovery approach, and it's proven with the ministries that George A. Wood has founded and that I've been supporting him with over the last almost four years now. We are looking at an 80% success rate, and the difference there is about the power of authentic community, de- destigmatizing these struggles within our communities and learning what it looks like to love and lead people better in the gentle way of Jesus. Uh, the importance of community um, is is big here, and you are highlighting that, Britt. Um, George, when we think about a devotional and we think about a daily devotional, we totally think about something that we just do in the privacy of our own, you know, quiet time. Um, you're, you are encouraging us, though, um, to not only do this as a personal experience, but to do this in community with others. Help, help me— get over that barrier or that hump? How do I, um, as an individual, you know, not just engage in this as like a personal private exercise, but how do I engage others in, in a, in a uncovery devotional process or group? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, key to it is, conversations and the you know what we tried to put together here in the devotional is you know the basic guidelines for conversations that a lot of times we don't have words for we don't we don't understand the the situation behind why a person may struggle with suicidal thoughts or why a person may struggle with addiction and mental health issues. So th- we tried to to put words to what we're feeling internally and conversations with others are the way to really um, grow and explore what God is trying to say to us as individuals and as the people we're walking through life with. You know, when I, when I talk to men I work with, often, you know, the situation is they don't know how to have that conversation with with the per, their coworker or with their close friends, you know, that they are trying to do life with. And, you know, this really gives them something to look at and say, oh, I didn't realize that the abuse I went through as a child, even though it wasn't as extreme as some have been through, it could have triggered some of the ways that I cope with problems at work today. And I can have this conversation with my close friends and then begin to walk through the healing process together, because now we can look at this together and and share our experience with each other, share what we've both been through so that we can share how we can grow going forward. 
And for me, it it the the life changing moment is when people realize that they're not alone. That other people have been through similar experiences. That other people have struggled in the same way and still struggle today. So often we get we gauge everything on how much money a person has, how how you know their job title, what kind of car they drive, all these you know uh, the the typical things that we sing in the American dream. But the reality is a lot of times those dreams behind them are nightmares and people are struggling and need to get out of their own way. And we can do that by walking through this with each other. If you're listening right now and you're wondering, hey, you know, like what's the what's the conversation um, behind this and, and how can I engage? The Sober Truth Project is um, is one place where you can find out a whole lot more about um, this the way that this conversation about recovery um, has changed, is changing, and and how you can engage with it. So SoberTruthProject.org. Britt, maybe tell us a little bit about that, because there's a connectivity here. This isn't um, this isn't a, everybody has to go to Tampa and, and hook up with uh, with George Wood, although you should. Um, but <laughs> you should. Uh, but, but there's a but there's a whole thing happening like you've you've you talked about it as a movement. Um, so can you mm-hmm. amplify that a little bit? Absolutely. So the Sober Truth Project was actually something that was birthed through George in the process of coming up with language for the uncovery. So when we started talking about how do we do recovery differently, our goal, our big vision was how do we change the way the world thinks about recovery one person at a time? What can we do to engage? We knew from the get go, the conversation probably started with leadership. We're faith leaders. And so we know within our spheres of influence, we were going to start with recovery leadership leaders in the church. That's what came out of the first book, which was just the uncovery, the power of community to heal trauma. We've translated that now into a 365 day devotional that speaks to the individual. But as we are looking at these things together and trying to understand the beauty of what the uncovery is, as it relates to the sober truth project, this is not just a program. This is not just a book. It's not another 12 step. It's not another rehab curriculum. This this is a way of shifting our mindset, the way that we think about people who struggle, the way that we think about our our lock, often lockstep legalistic programming that is not working, by the way, <laughs> the ways we have typically tried to shepherd people in these places. And it's about shifting that mindset so much that within our faith communities and even beyond that, those people who were once on the margins of society become our brothers and sisters, our equals who we are walking with. We don't want to judge someone just because they struggle differently than we do. And if we're really honest, If you walk through one of these two books and you can't pause for a moment and say, wow, this hit me personally because I struggle with X, Y, Z, then you're not doing it right. You're really not listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit because I don't care how great your walk with the Lord is. I don't care how hard you have been working to live a clean and sober and fruitful life. This is about looking and owning your own stuff so that you can deal with it and better love and lead people through their stuff. We go through what we go through so we can help other people go through what we went through. This is the essence of the gospel. Recovery is the gospel. And so tying that into the Sober Truth Project, we said, this isn't just a book. Wow, we need a place for people to be able to stop, to come to us, to connect with us, and to not only read, but get involved in the conversation to, you know, let's let's create events together. Let's create masterminds together. Let's create coaching cohorts together where we can begin to train up leadership to better love and lead people. The Sober Truth Project is the place to do that. And the resources that come with that and the movement that comes along with that is the uncovery. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good. Uh, We're talking about the Uncovery Devotional, Rethinking Recovery One Day at a Time. Uh, George A. Wood and Britt Eaton are our conversation partners. They're the co-authors of the book, and we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LeBurge, host of Mornings with Carmen. How good are you? You feeling good? You doing good? God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Goodness is the character of God and the work of God, but we don't always feel so good, do we? I mean, are you good? You feeling good? You doing good? 
Maybe you have a sense that you need some healing, that you desire some wholeness. Our friend Susie Larson has a new book, Waking Up to the Goodness of God, 40 Days Toward Healing and Wholeness, and we'd like for you to have a copy. Faith Radio is giving away 100 copies of Susie's new book, and we'd like for you to have one. So enter to win yours now at MyFaithRadio.com. We want to know the goodness of God all the time. Connecting Faith to Life, Faith Radio. We're continuing our conversation with George Wood and Britt Eaton. The book is The Uncovery Devotional, Rethinking Recovery One Day at a Time. George, I'm going to ask you, um, if you would right now, um, to just talk directly to Rick. Um, I feel confident Rick is listening. He listens every single day, so I feel incredibly confident he's listening right now. Rick um, is in Wisconsin. He is most likely in his car um, where he very likely slept last night with his dog because that's the reality of his life. Um, things I know about Rick, he loves the Lord. He's a total foodie. He loves to cook. Uh, he's a believer. He's also in what I would describe as this like chronic cycle that has resulted in him not having consistent work and therefore not having a consistent place to live, um, an inability to maintain relationships. He's disconnected in just about every way that um, that a person could be. And yet he's a part of this fellowship and this community. And I'd love for you to invite Rick mm-hmm. not into recovery because he's tried that. He's been there. He's done that. In- invite him into, into this new life that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um... For one, I would just say, you know, Rick, wherever you're at right now, you know, and I know that people say these things and they come across as trite, but the Lord sees you and knows you and he knows your heart and he knows the life that he has for you. I would say that, you know, even though you can feel so alone, we're we're never alone. And God is always there and he's, he's always inside of us and moving and leading us. And so now is a time to begin to see what he's leading you to. And that there are going to be times when he puts into your life people that um, may be a, a path to something so much more. And if you've hung on for as long as you've hung on and, and went through what you've went through, that the Lord does have something for you. And and it's not about recovery. It's not about even trying to look at your life and say that this is all wrong. It's leading you to something. It's leading you to something more. And the, the heart of understanding God is him having you understand that whatever you've went through that was not from him, he wants to heal you from. And that everything that you've been through in your your life, whether it's in your childhood or the experiences that have come after that, that were not from God, they've caused you to see the world in a view that limits the choices that you have and limits the opportunities that you have. But when you begin to get healed from everything that's happened to you that was not from God— the pain, the trauma, the um, experiences that you've been through that have hurt you and scarred you in many ways, that once you're healed from them, and God does want to, can, and will heal you from them, that that is when the world begins to open up. And that is when you begin to see things differently. So it's not a matter of, you know, finances or the right job or getting the right things. It's about what God is putting in your in your path that's from him that begins to change your life in a way that brings you to who he's called you to be. It's about understanding that once we heal from things, that's what opens up our opportunities. So often we look at what opportunities can come our way as our healing, but it's the healing that comes first that allows us to even see them as the opportunities. And so I would just say wherever you are in Wisconsin, it's got to be freezing right now. Mm -hmm. Hang on. 
that God sees you, that there is something more. And I want you to try today with everything in you to begin to see the world differently and to see the people that come into your life differently as being a possible path from God towards this healing that I'm talking about. Because God's seeing you and no matter what happens, because the reality is life doesn't always turn out the way that we want it. God has called you before the foundations of the world. He has seen you before then and sees you as his beloved son, one that he truly holds in the palm of his hand as his beloved son, who he is, he is truly pleased with. And that will not change, nor will his love for you. And so I'm just declaring right now over his life, Rick, wherever you are, I'm declaring right now that things are going to begin to change and that within this year, you will be calling Carmen to say your life has radically changed. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that's going to look like, but it's going to be radically different in a way that only God can do. And you're going to have a powerful testimony that is going to speak the truth of who God truly is and how he sees his sons and how he takes care of them. And I am believing this, Rick, and I'm declaring this over you right now, that your testimony will do the same for others. It will lead them from their darkness and from their trials to the beautiful, wonderful light of God. That's so good. George, thank you so much. That's George A. Wood. We're also um, here with Britt Eaton. They are the co-authors of the Uncovery Devotional, Rethinking Recovery One Day at a Time. Um, George and Britt, um, thank you so much. We're going to close today by just reading um, today's page out of um, out of the devotional. So this is January 11th, Transformative Perseverance. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. You can do hard things. No, really, you can. No matter how long it takes, no matter how impossible it seems, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. This transformative perseverance is a key concept in the Apostle Paul's writings, and it's been proven throughout Scripture and in all the lives of believers for generations. When we partner with God's will, we can accomplish things we never, ever could on our own. Now, let's explore what this powerful passage of truth is not saying. It does not say, I can do anything and everything I want, and Christ will strengthen me. This, if, uh, if you can dream it, you can do it mentality leads to disappointment and destruction every time. Worldly perseverance um, will tell you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and try harder so that you'll be successful. Kingdom perseverance means holding fast and leaning on the Father's strength, especially in times of suffering. Staying steadfast in the everyday as you walk out your recovery journey is no small task. The tough times are tough, uh, but the boring times can be absolutely brutal. Our very human desire to be titillated can be our downfall. Unless we choose to elevate our existence and focus on what's true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good, virtuous, and praiseworthy, see Philippians 4, 8. You can do anything you want um, when, uh, when what you want is what God wants, and he wants you healed, whole, and transformed. And in his strength, you will be. God, I confess I don't always know what's best for me. I think I know what I want, but I know you know better. So check my motives today and show me your way to find healing and hope. That is uh, today's entry in the Uncovery Devotional, Rethinking Recovery One Day at a Time. All right, friend, um, small things, still small voice. Let's get into the Word of God before we get out there into the world that God so loves. And let's remember that we are blessed. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his full attention to you and give you peace. Have a great day and God bless. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.